Hello everyone, welcome to Building Blocks 2022, Day 1. This is the recorded stream recap of the first day's events, and you can find the specific timestamps of the various talks and workshops timestamped in the description below or on the YouTube playhead. If you are looking for a specific workshop, you can also click on the playlist linked in the description below where you can find workshops both from our pre-event as well as the next 3 days extracted and uploaded as its own separate video. Without further ado, let's begin with a short opening by Associate Professor Bimlesh Wadwa, Senior Lecturer and Assistant Dean Student Life at the National University of Singapore School of Computing. Prof Bimlesh, please. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to School of Computing. Uh, this is your first day of building blocks uh, and uh, I hope you really enjoy and have a good learning, uh, you know, day as well as uh, a fruitful day there. And uh, sorry, I couldn't be there physically at the venue, but I'm very happy that uh, you are having, you know, the building blocks back in the face-to-face uh, -face mode. Uh, we had building blocks before at SOC and that was, uh, you know, in the physical mode, but now like today we are having a hybrid and I hope. Uh, this continues next year and becomes bigger and bigger and we have more face-to-face uh, -face interactions. Uh, so once again, a very warm welcome uh, to SOC and uh, wishing you all the best for the conference. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Vinesh. Now let's get Building Work started with a talk by the Lead Program Manager of AI Singapore, Mr. Chandra. Mr. Chandra is a program manager with over 11 years of experience in public-private people partnerships, community development, and capacity building. He is passionate about education, youth empowerment, and sustainable okay. development. Yeah. Mr. Chandra is on a mission to improve AI literacy and proficiency among young adults in Singapore. Without further ado, let's warmly welcome Mr. Chandra. Yes, yes, morning. Hello, guys, morning. Can you hear me? Okay, so, okay, so uh, my name is Chandra. I'm the, the lead program manager in AI uh, Singapore. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Matwa, uh, Watwa, sorry, here yeah, for, for giving the welcome remarks. Yeah, okay, anyone uh, here has heard about AI Singapore before? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, we, we are pretty young. Actually, we, we were set up. Uh, back in 2017, okay, the National AI Program uh, Office, our mission is really to build AI talent pool uh, in Singapore. So uh, we seek to aim, uh, we aim to, to improve the AI uh, literacy and uh, proficiency of um, the, 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 the population uh, in Singapore. Okay, um, we'll uh, start with something more fun, okay, rather than doing, uh, you know, a formal uh, kind of intro. Um, everyone here knows uh, Kahoot, right? Our good old friend <laughs> gained popularity, you know, during the, the COVID-19 because of the uh, hybrid mode of learning. So if, yeah, okay, I'll just start this Kahoot session. Mm -hmm. Top three winners will be getting some Japanese chocolate, one of the countries that we miss the most. We haven't been able to go there yet. <laughs> at the moment, maybe just a small tour group. Okay. Um, let's see. Is it showing now? Oops. Uh, one second. Not yet. <laughs> Kahoot.it. The game pin is 6104752. 6104752. Yeah. We have Kat here, Ezil, Su, Su Huan, one, two, three, Raj. Adorable lobster, okay. <laughs> Who loves lobster here? <laughs> Who's adorable lobster? <laughs> Ashley, Zaire, Raj. The Quirty, Uwu, okay. <laughs> uh, pra, pra Samsa, Lex, Aryan, Kiros. G42. Oh, I know some of you are at, at home to work in school. Yeah, please feel free to join too. Let's find out how I can pass you the chocolate if you do win uh, this, uh, you know, lethal quiz. 
Uh, let's see, uh, we have how many now? 72, 23 of you, five. Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Biden is here. <laughs> I love Elston. Oh, okay. Who is Elston and who loves Elston? <laughs> Lil Meow Meow, okay. Cat lover. Mm -hmm. uh, big Meow Meow, okay. <laughs> big and Lil. Okay, let's give some time. Is it showing now? Oh, it's showing now. Okay, very good. Yes. Six one zero four seven five two. Basically, the music is fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. There's some music, huh? Yeah. Just realize. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I miss that 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 theme song. You know, that ding 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 ding. Okay, you better. Oh, can you use my? Oh, it can be at least the Zoom people can hear. Ah, oh, okay, okay, sure. Okay, can you guys hear? No, no, no. Yeah. No, I think they can hear. Um, oh, because of the echo. This has been a theme song for the past few years. Hundred ish, okay. I mean, okay. We have ninety nine. Yeah, let's start first. Uh. No, I'm being mindful of the time because we are behind the time. Okay, let's start. Question number one is, hello. <laughs> okay, it's an easy question. Warm up. Yeah. What does AI need in order to work? Data, algorithm. Or data and algorithm, easy peasy. <laughs> it's like a hundred percent correct answer, huh? Oh. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Eh? Okay, right, yeah. So yes, actually we do need both data and algorithms. Um uh, eight and six, I think you guys would know um more from the next workshop set that building blocks will be conducting for the next few days, okay? Next, question number two, okay? What are some of the AI uh, use cases which use or uses the deep learning algorithms? Okay, that's the keyword, uh, deep learning. Computer vision, NLP, speech recognition, or all of them. Good. Yeah. So all of them, okay? Computer vision, NLP, and speech recognition. Mm -hmm. Jeryl, the quality. How to pronounce this? Uh, Uwu, is it? Yeah. Chang Yan Chun. <laughs> okay, now we talk about AI ethics. Okay, so um, when we talk about AI ethics, who we should empathize with, okay? The people providing the data, the negatively impacted users, or the different user groups, or actually, you know, all of the options. Okay, very good. Yeah. People providing data, we talk about, you know, people giving consent or PDPA related stuff. Negatively impacted users is really the uh, uh, what if, uh, what we program, AI goes wrong. So, whose responsibility it is? Um, and the different user groups, uh, we talk about the gender, uh, representation, race, and others. Okay, so we have Jeryl, Yuzen, and Jarrett, top three. Okay, true or false, okay? AI systems are only as good as the data they train on. What do you think? It's a tricky question, huh? AI systems are only as good as the data they train on. Yeah, it's false, it's false. This is one of the AI myths that Google has been trying to uh, demystify, okay? Uh, yes, 
So AI systems actually have four ingredients, right? The data, algorithms, hardware, and human talent. So data is only one of them. Okay, this should be the last question. Yeah. In Singapore, we have a speech engine which recognizes and transcribes English, Mandarin, and Singlish. What do you think? Do we have it already or is it still under development, true or false? True or false? The keyword is English. Right? Ah, yes. Very good, very good, yeah. It's actually uh, called Speech Lab. I'm gonna play this little, oh, is it showing? Okay, let me play this. Oh, but there's no sound, right? Mm. Hello, good afternoon, SCDF emergency. How can I help you? Okay, basically, Hello, can you please yeah. come to Jalan Sultan? Yeah. There's a fire. Yeah. Yeah. Please hurry ah. up and come. Good idea. Now, as you can see, this automatic speech recognition system can transcribe 995 emergency calls, yeah. not just in Singlish, but in other national languages yeah. as well. Now, it's in a proof of concept stage, but it is one of the ways the SCDF is using technology to help process its emergency. Okay, good. Yep, it's one of our pride. Yeah, in Air Singapore, Speech Lab is, is one of the projects that we are working on. Okay, how do I witness? Okay, we have a bonus question. How are you feeling this morning? <laughs> Fantastic, super duper. I don't know what is this baby doing. It's probably <laughs> he's not angry, right? He's excited about the day ahead. <laughs> Which one? Which one? What are you guys feeling? <laughs> Let's see. Great. Okay. Great. You guys are feeling fantastic. Really good. Okay. Great. Let's see who's the winner. Third place. Y N W A. Okay. Ian and Vinny. Yeah. Congrats, guys. Yeah. Later after the event, uh, come to me, I'll pass you the, the, the Japanese chocolate that I promise you. Okay, great. Okay, I have um, like five minutes uh, to go. So I'll just introduce a bit of what uh, we do, right? Uh, AI Singapore, um, uh, what uh, we do. Basically, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, discussed this earlier. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll uh, start off with this. This is our... Uh, AI uh, student outreach program. Okay, you might have heard about this uh, program from Mr. Gee or the organizers, right? Uh, this is the new program that uh, we have launched in collaboration with MOE, right? Very simple, uh, three levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Beginner level, uh, about five hours self-directed learning. Then uh, you guys would obtain the literacy and AI certificate by AI uh, Singapore, okay? Uh, I challenge you guys here, uh, since you're attending a Building Blocks event, right? You have a passion in, 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 in AI or tech in general. Uh, go for the Foundations in AI Certificate, 140 hours, yeah, self directed learning. And uh, this uh, has been recognized by NUS and SUSS Business as a five uh, uh, module uh, credits, uh, credit units, right? So in uh, NUS, we are in discussion with them uh, to extend this to pre-university students too, so that um, uh, you guys can complete this now, and when you uh, uh, enter uh, NUS next time, that will be uh, considered as, as one of the unit that you have cleared already. Okay, that's uh, Foundations AI. Level three, very simple. Go and take up the Google uh, Professional ML Engineer Certificate. ML Ops is, is the hot area right now. We need talents in this area. In fact, this is the component that MOE uh, uh, kind of uh, sponsors the most, right? Uh, take the certification, come back to us with your cert, then we will reimburse uh, the, the, the exam fee. I think it's about US dollar 200, about that, yes. And if you need to subscribe uh, to Coursera Plus, for example, or you need to subscribe to Quick Labs, we will reimburse that too. Coursera Plus, if I'm not mistaken, it's about US dollar 399. Uh, Quick Labs, about $100. So yeah, you guys can come to us and uh, 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 reimburse uh, the, the, the fees that you, you, you have, um, you know, spent on, right? So, uh, level three graduates will welcome you guys to apply uh, for our internship opportunities. Oops, sorry. Internship opportunities uh, with us, AI Singapore, 
working on uh, project or projects, right, uh, with our sponsoring partners. The first one will be CSIT, yes, and uh, depending on, on the terms, conditions that will be dictated by the sponsoring partners. For example, uh, CSIT dealing with South East Priority, uh, uh, you know, in Singapore, so they would require certain uh, uh, nationality, yes, and also on the educational, educational level. Yeah, but we'll have more such opportunities in the, in the future. Yeah, so we'll invite everyone to, 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 to join us. Okay, just one more thing before I pass the time back to the organizing committee. Um, we encourage you guys in order to access level one, two, three, to form a student user group. Um, what, what, what is this or what's behind this? Uh, we heard often uh, people doing self-related learning that they feel uh, alone, the journey is not easy, right? So we believe in peer-to-peer -peer learning, community learning. We want students to at least have um, another nine students to, to journey uh, together with them, form a student uh, user group from the same institution, yes, or uh, within, uh, you know, building blocks, uh, 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 so-called organization like this, right, so that you guys can support each other. Yeah, so that's uh, the only requirement. And of course, uh, uh, because this is a kind of a government program, right, there's a 70% uh, 30% requirement, 70% Singaporean and uh, the uh, PRs, yes, and 30% can be international students. Okay, that, that's all uh, from me. Actually, let's see, uh, these are just, you know, like some of the, the details. I can share with, with the team later and, and forward to you because we are behind time now. Um, let's see, yes, this is the internship program. Oh, we do uh, organize hackathon uh, end of the year, usually in November or December, inviting everyone to join us as well. Uh, learn uh, whatever you can uh, uh, today and then participate uh, end of uh, the, the year. Yes, um, I think, you know, the thing about Hackathon is really sometimes not about winning or losing, but, you know, uh, learning as much as possible and, and make friends. That's very important. Yeah, networking, make friends. That, that will uh, 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 bring you far in life. Lah. Yeah. Okay, student user group, yeah, go to this uh, website. And uh, I think Building Blocks uh, is facilitating this too. Yes. Yeah, that's all from me. Yes, before I uh, end uh, my uh, kind of yeah, like presentation, I just uh, would like to congratulate um, the organizing committee, Building Blocks, Mr. Ki, uh, Riang, Ik Ting, uh, where is Ik Ting? Yeah, Ik Ting is there. Yeah, Le Chi, and then uh, the rest of the organizing committee. Uh, thank you for taking the leadership, yeah, uh, to, to promote AI literacy and proficiency in Singapore. It's, it's, it's great to be back in a physical event like this after a long time, at least for me, yes. And uh, uh, all the best, yes, for the next um, two days, right? Uh, uh, today and the next two days, so three days of event. Uh, enjoy the journey and yeah, that's all from me. Uh, and uh, find me anytime later if you have any questions. Okay, thank you guys, all the best. Yeah, uh, Chandra here, thank you. Yeah. No worries, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chandra. Next up, I'm sure many of you are unfamiliar with the faces in your group. So how about we break the ice with some icebreakers? Please proceed to your respective values for the icebreakers and remember to go to the go.buildingblocks.sg slash discord to join the discord. And have fun! Uh, I'll be disseminating the groups by groups. Uh, first of all, can I get all teachers to follow Mr. Gee out of the venue? Thank you. All teachers follow Mr. Gee out of the venue. All group is still three set ready. Thank you. For the people online, uh, please head over to Discord. Discord. Thank you, groups 1 to 4 to please make your way to SR6, follow the insult and anchor. Insult and anchor, please raise your hand. Please follow the insult and anchor, groups 1, 2, 3, and 4. Thank you. Please, please uh, stand up, group Okay, for the groups now. Okay, for the groups that are Okay, for the groups that are online, uh, please head over to this. Don't disconnect from Discord, but head, do head over to Discord, and uh, you will you will see a, a category pop up with your group number, and and inside there will be a text channel and a voice chat. 
So do feel free to hop into the voice channel. Your group facilitators will be there. Uh, and they will facilitate your icebreakers from there. Yeah. Uh, and then around 10.40, the group facilitators also please take note. Around 10.40, please uh, get your, your group to head back to the, uh, to the Zoom session for the next part of today's event. Thank you. challenge and then we start with the hackathon stuff where we reveal the problem statement and stuff. So first let's start with design thinking. So uh, wait no, actually this slide should precede that. Okay, uh, so where are the materials? So I will have to skim through a lot of these, uh, especially the design principles and stuff, but all of these will be made available after the session. So why do you want to use design thinking? In short, you really just want to build something that people actually want to use. Because you know, if, if you just build not everyone will just automatically use it. So you might be familiar with uh, stuff like design thinking framework. So like first you have to empathize with your users, you have to define the problem, you have to start ideating, you have to start prototyping, you have to start testing, stuff like that. But um, you know, other ways that we can do is we can also start tr by trying to find a problem first. So we come up with a problem, then we start to try to understand the problem, and then we think about who's actually affected by it. And then, uh, you know, just list out a whole bunch of ideas that can solve the problem. You know, you don't have to strike down any at this stage. You can just keep an open mind. And you can come up with a final problem statement. So this is an example of what a problem statement looks like. So it's like my, my app or my website will help who with, you know, a problem, opportunity, or challenge by doing what. So don't try to do this where you make an overly vague thing where, you know, like, my website will help everyone with you know, remembering their lines for a presentation by using machine learning. That makes no sense because no one knows how it actually works. So you can be a bit more specific like this. So my website will help developers with solving problems by providing a questions and answers platform. So that's Stack Overflow. Then um, my website will help students with you know, working together with, while coding by providing a real-time collaborative coding platform, kind of like Google Docs. You know, that, that sounds very cool. Yeah. And Finally, you know, my, my website will help everyone with you know, cleaning up their email by using machine learning to automatically sort and organize them. So that's Inbox by Google, which they discontinued, and I'm still sad about it. But uh, yeah, so this is how problem statements work. But the easiest way to show all of these is actually just by doing it. So I'll just give a quick demo on using a prototyping journal in this case. Okay, so why you would want to use one is it helps to organize your thoughts. So listing down and like mentioning all of these in a document also allows everyone in your team to be on the same page about what, about the status of the product. It also helps you know document the journey while designing the website. So this is the prototyping journal. So let's head back here. Okay. So ah no, I I don't oh, sure. Okay. So this is a demo of the journal. I think I'll share it with all of you later. So uh, let's set this a bit. Okay, so this is a bit bigger. So first, uh, the journal kind of guides you through a bunch of like steps. So this is um, this is because we got very distracted by these cool features in Google Docs. Okay, but um, so first you try to start thinking of problems. So when you release the the problem statement later, you can kind of think about based on the problem statement and the target audience they mentioned. Are there any problems that they face and stuff? And then you can go. So maybe I want to. 
let's think of one right now. Uh, you know what? Homework, okay? Uh, I don't want to do my homework. And then uh, my group, which is just me, thinks that this is an amazing idea. So, yep. And if, if you want, you can always add more problems here. So I want to add more problems, and I do not have any problem, which is a problem. So I have no problems. So this, yeah, so you said that's bad. So this is bad. Okay, so now, so now you pick the most interesting one, and uh, this is the most interesting one I found, because that's the only one I like. So now explain it in one sentence. So I can say in this case, uh, some people find homework tiring to do. I think in one hand it's actually surprisingly tiring. Um, okay, so then start to understand. So dig deeper. Why, why do your target audience actually feel this way? And like try to understand the problem a bit more. So Maybe you want to know like why uh, why do teachers give homework? Okay, I, I'm taking very long to type. Okay, so maybe I don't know, so I want to learn more. And maybe um how do I get around it? Yeah, I'm tempted to. <laughs> Yep, so maybe I already know how to get around it, you know, just coming up with a bunch of homework excuses, that would be very helpful. So, okay, so now who actually cares? So, uh, in, in your actual journal, you should be filling out a bit more than this, so that you can understand the problem a bit better. But now who actually cares? So, obviously students, uh, um, obviously other stakeholders, so other stakeholders can be teachers. I mean, they are not directly affected by the homework, but they are stakeholders in that they give the homework. So, teachers. And yeah, I guess that's it. So now let's start ideating. Okay, so, um, oh. oh, new mic. Okay, uh, Tess, can you hear me? Are you able to hear him? Are you able to hear? Okay, so, uh, so first let's start with an idea. Okay, so uh, maybe let's have a website uh, that shows AI-generated homework excuses. You know, because uh, if we use AI-generated homework excuses, it'll always be unique every single time, which is very important, you know. Uh, um, constant stream of unique excuses. So, so now I, I should come up with more um, ideas. So maybe, um, maybe a reminders app to remind me of homework, um, how it'll help remind me of homework. Okay, and, and then now you start to think, based on these ideas that you come up with, so you can come up with a whole bunch of these ideas, like, because you work in a group, you, you know, at least each person can come up with two, and then you start to focus in. So now you go and look through all of these and go, okay, now what exactly do we want in our product? So now you think, okay, so my website will help blank, so uh, students with their homework by generating, uh, by using AI to generate homework excuses. You know, so th this, this will be my revolutionary um, billion dollar startup, I think. Uh, so, yeah, so, then you start to think about this from the perspective of now what are the goals that you want to achieve? So let's say, okay, so now we want to be able to generate excuse. So, you know, that would be very important because that is a core functionality. Wait, no, that's a very important, very important. And uh, maybe, um, you know, you might want to also have features like I want to assign it to a teacher because if I use the same excuse on the same teacher, right, they're going to call me out on it. So I cannot do that. So I need to assign the teacher an excuse to a teacher to prevent reusing excuses. So this is good to have. I'm, I mean, it's somewhat important, but like it's not as important as generating excuses. So you can come up with a whole bunch of these goals for your product. And 
eventually you come to the, the planning stage. So this is where you actually figure out what exactly you want inside here. So uh, you think about the actions that the user will take and the results. So maybe uh, they enter the website, so visit the website. So what they want to see is a list of uh, excuses they can choose from. And to overcomplicate this, maybe we have a login page. Uh, log, uh, click on login button. Uh, sign into the website. Assign, uh, you know, then they'll be able to uh, see favorited excuses. Sure, that works. Uh, th this, this app is completely fictional, by the way. Uh, no, no one's actually going to build it. Uh, <laughs> And then you can also add a whole bunch of more ac actions and results in this case, but you can also realize that you don't need a whole bunch of different actions in your app, to m in your website to just make it a good website. Some, some websites are just very good at one thing. No, just have very few actions, but they do those very well. And then you start prototyping. So now you, decide, you define your user flows. So, what your u so think of this like a morning routine or something. So step by step, what you do. So maybe my user visits my website. So uh, let's say um, uh, get excused. So the user visits the website and then the next step they want to do is they want to look, uh, they will see a list of excuses. So then the user can uh, select excuse. So once they select an excuse, they can copy the excuse to the clipboard, okay? Copy excuse to clipboard. Uh, user can share the excuse with their teacher. And maybe we have another login flow. So maybe the user can visit uh, the website. User clicks login. User enters credentials. And then uh, after the user has entered their credentials and all, we can also just go and say, uh, you know what, the user can see a list of uh, see favorite that excuses and uh, what else? You know what? That's that's good enough. I mean, your actual one would probably have more flows, but in this case, I'm trying to do a demo, and we are running short of time. But so at this stage, what's next is you go onto Figma and you start designing already, and you actually start to think about this from the perspective of okay, so now using your user flows, what your user does step by step. Now, actually translating this into like an actual interface. So now let's head back to the slides, which I accidentally closed. So now let's talk about Figma. So think about Figma like, uh, you know, if you've used Google Slides or PowerPoint, but slightly more powerful. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of design tools out there, but we use Figma because it is free and it is, you know, it's fairly simple to use. Uh, it is a pretty easy prototyping tool. Other options are like XD. Um, some people use Illustrator if they have money. Uh, there are s other things like Sketch and stuff like that, but Figma is the easiest. Uh, and Figma is collaborative uh, where like I can send a link to other people and they can all work on the same project together, which might be useful in this case where you're in a hackathon and everyone needs to work together. And it's a fairly popular tool actually used by a whole bunch of different companies. So now let's get started with Figma. So if you head over to figma.com, uh, you can see this is their website, very nice. Uh, and then um, if you don't already have an account, you can sign up, but I do, so I will have mine logged in over here. So after you have, no, I, I don't want my settings. Okay, so after you have signed up or logged in, uh, you'll see this page and you can select a new design file. So, now you can say, okay, so let's call this project a uh, building blocks demo. So now you can select up here in frames, and then you can come over here. Let me make all of these slightly bigger. Okay. Right, that, that, that went terribly. Uh, Figma does not allow me to command laugh because, however, uh, I think I can do this. Yep, I can. Uh, so you can select up here, uh, I think you can just select presentation and you can go 16 by 9. So 16 by 9 is just the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And now you can start designing your website. So you can come up to the top corner and say, this is my homepage, okay? 
So this is my home page. And uh, let's say, you know, this is a homework excuse generator. So this is, uh, maybe I want a list of excuses over here. So let's come here and let's create a box here. And then let's say, uh, my dog ate my homework. This will work on every single teacher, I believe. You know what? We can also bold it. We can set the text as pretty large. Give it some space here. And yep, you know what? This is good enough. And then you can set the color over here. So under fill, you can set the color. So maybe I want a red over here. Yep. And you can also, if you select the corners over here, you can start to round the corner. So you want those like fancy, very iOS Apple look, sure. And you can also duplicate this. Uh, in this case, I'm holding down the Option key, but if you're on Windows, you can hold down the Alternate key. And yeah, you know what? Now, now, this, now this looks like an amazing, very legit website that I can use and everyone will visit. And maybe I want another button here, which is my Login button. Uh, so you can also search up like SVGs and import them here, but I don't actually have one now, so that's too bad. It'll be a nice little circle for now. So there's a whole bunch of other features, like there's a pen tool if you feel like illustrating a bunch of lines, and then you can fill it. Ah, wait, no, I need to close the path. Yep. And then you can start to add fills to the shape. And there are a whole bunch of shapes here, so you can draw circles in this case. And it is fairly flexible where, you know, you can just press run and then you can, yeah. You, you can see this prototype here and then if it loads, you can see, and you can stretch the page further so that it actually add, so that the prototype actually scrolls. Yep. So this oh it doesn't scroll because web, but yeah. Anyways, so this is basically how Figma works. So you can add a whole bunch of UI elements here and you can customize the interface like this, okay? So this is a very brief view of Figma. Feel free to spend a lot more time on this and yeah. Okay, now let's continue on with the slide. So let's talk about UI and UX design, okay? So the key thing here is that design is not just art. It's, well, a design may look nice. Design also has to serve a purpose. Like you, you don't just put a button over there and just be like, it looks nice there it has to be like, there is a reason why you put it there instead of, let's say, in the top corner or something. So design is also like not super easy. You know, you can't just create a great design. I mean, th this, this Figma prototype is obviously amazing, but you can't just make a great design in like, like two hours or something. And you're not going to just be an amazing designer immediately after this session. But by understanding the rationale behind other designs, you can actually learn from them and adapt them within your design. So it is important to do a whole bunch of iterations and show it to different people to get feedback and see what people want. And, but there is no singular design that works for everyone. You know, you'll get a bunch of people who would still complain about your design even though you know, it is like good enough, but you have to check for feedback from a bunch of users. So then there's, there are these design principles. So take note that there are no hard and fast rules on design. I mean, these are all just a bunch of guidelines that you can follow. You can choose not to follow them, but these are things that will help you accomplish a good design. So the first one is layout. Uh, yes. So the first thing is that you want margins in that you don't want stuff to be right next to one another because things will start to look very cramped if you know you have a bunch of items or you have very large density, like every single thing is next to one another. It doesn't actually make sense to the user because you know everything is super cramped and they don't know what to look at. So start to space things out and you know, in a sense, let your interface elements breathe. Then next, uh, you should think about your layout. Your layout should be for everyone, you know, it should work whether your user is trying to use your website on a phone or a computer or something, but think about your target audience first. If your target audience are more likely to use your website on a phone, then think about spending more time and effort to optimize that site for mobile. And your goal is to provide a good experience to all users, but if that's not possible, to as many users as possible. 
So think about considerations in your layout as well. When you're laying things out, what is most important to your user? So realistically, you know, you have a very limited amount of space. You can't just dump every single button in there and pray that it fits. You know, when you lay things out, think ahead. Is this layout actually feasible? You know, you, you might want a scroll view and a scroll view and a whatever nonsense. Check if it's possible to implement. So let's say, okay, let's have a hypothetical scenario. You know, maybe you're working on this uh, fictional contact tracing app and you want a whole bunch of features over here. So you might have this ridiculous interface, which is, you know, which turns out to be, you know, very cramped and very cluttered and, you know, just your user doesn't know what to click on because everything is there. Uh, well, the app is completely functional, but, you know, to the user, it just feels very hastily put together and everything is everywhere. But you can fix it by just hiding stuff in submenus because you don't need to show everything to your user at the same time. And uh, consider just saving the home screen, like the first page they go on, to put the most the, the information that will be most important to, to the user so that it's easiest for them to access. And also, having empty space isn't exactly a bad thing. So now, let's move to colors. Oh, these slides are great. Um, so there are different color harmonies, so you can use this uh, when you're picking a color palette for your design because you want to stick to a consistent color palette and theme in your design. If you pick colors from everywhere, then your design will also look very messy. So colors also have meaning. So you know, if you look at all of these colors, what do these evoke? I mean, the background just evokes blindness, but these colors here, they, they do have meaning and they do have association. These associations can also differ based on like cultures and stuff, but that is well beyond this scope. And also think about the colors within your site, actually. So colors are important in your website's experience. So if you have a red button over there, like you know how like logout buttons are always red or like, are you, like delete my account forever kind of thing. Those are called destructive actions. The, these are like actions that are in a sense irreversible. You don't want your user to accidentally go and click it and then suddenly they're like, wait, what, what, ha what just happened? So it is in a sense to wake your user up. Also consistency matters. So uh, colors help to form your website's visual identity. So it's important to choose from like a limited color palette. So, so that it also allows you to, sure. It also allows you to communicate your brand. So think about this, you know, how you associate like the orange from PowerPoint with PowerPoint and green with Excel and blue with Word and same with uh, Google Slides and if you use Mac OS and iWork, those. Then what about gradients? This slide used to be worse, but uh, they made me make it less worse. Okay. Uh, yeah, so gradients are dangerous in, in that, you know, if, they, if they're done right, they can actually make your interface look really modern and really actually pretty professional. But the issue is that if they're done wrong, they can kind of look very messy and very tacky, like, you know, this entire slide. And they look like a five-year-old vomited crayon on your screen and something that came out of the 2000s. So general guidelines is that you don't actually want to have too many colors in your gradients. Uh, stick to like a monochromatic gradient, which means one color. So maybe a light shade of, a light shade of blue to a darker shade of blue. And then look at the background. Please don't do that. So let's say you're a designer of this, you know, this right hailing service. So this is your design, okay? So yeah, I mean, it makes sense, I guess. Your buttons are nicely placed, but the colors don't actually make sense because now you, you look at this and you go, what's actually clickable? Is, is this area, uh, I believe there's a pointer mode, but I'm too lazy to find it. Oh, here. Is this area actually clickable? Is this one clickable? Am I supposed to click on this only? You don't actually know what's clickable. And that's kind of the point. If you limit the number of colors down to just the ones that are, uh, for example, this one only has three colors, it, it's now a lot clearer which ones, which elements you want to focus on. So maybe you want to just focus on this one word, no, this one button here, and everything else doesn't need focus. And you can use the green as your like brand color in this sense. Now let's talk about contrast. Yeah, the, the, the projector doesn't help with that. Uh, so contrast can help to increase readability. I mean, you saw in the title slide, if the projector was, yeah, the, 
you, you saw in the title slide, it is very hard to read. And that's kind of the point. So if you have, for example, white text on a, on a very light gray background, it becomes hard to read, but if you make it dark, it works. But it can also be used to create hierarchy. So for example, your subtitle might be a lighter shade of gray than let's say your title. And it can also be used to separate different sections in your website. Uh, I reused this slide, so it might still say app, but yes. So, um, for example, you see a whole bunch of like very flat design sites might use a darker shade for like a site or something. So let's say you are designing a news app, okay? Now, uh, because you design a whole bunch of random apps now, and then someone complains, you know, you use white color and then your image got white. What do you expect me to read? And then you look at this, and then this is the design. So. I mean, obviously, we can st all still read it, but think about this from the perspective of someone who doesn't have as good vision as uh, us, and then they look at this and go, I cannot read half the words on here, and I don't like this website. So I guess you can change the color to black, but you still face the issue, and if your image changes, uh, you face the issue again. So what you can do in this case is, you can like contemplate why on earth you chose to base it on an animal that is both black and white, or you can try to actually fix it. So the solution in this case is to like try to darken the image or something so that, that it provides enough contrast such that it is actually visible and readable. So y you have to think about it when you, like let's say you allow users to import images or you are loading images from a feed or something because if you are overlaying text on top of it, sometimes they can become very easily unreadable like this. Yep, okay, now let's talk about typography. How much time do I have? Still got time. Okay, so typography um, is basically choosing your fonts. Okay, please don't pick every single font. It is a terrible idea. So stick to one or two fonts. If you go too many, if you go with too many, no one actually know what's going on. So having um, multiple fonts will make things appear kind of unprofessional. Like, look at this slide, very unprofessional, right? Okay, so it may be tempting to just use a whole bunch of different fonts, but you know, it's kind of a nightmare because coding-wise, you have to add a whole bunch of, like, you have to link up a whole bunch of fonts, but in your design, your design will look very inconsistent pa from page to page. So, you know, like, we, we are very professional here and we use one font only for, like, this entire deck, except for this slide, which has, like, 10 different fonts. And play with your font weights. So font weights are basically this. So you see it's lighter at the top and then bolder at the bottom. Uh, yeah, so font weights allow you to add emphasis, but you know you might not want things to be that bold in that sense, so you can maybe use a medium. So they can allow you to create a hierarchy in this case. So for example, this uh, PDF thing over here, this, oh wow, the colors on this thing is not great, but, uh, I should have picked the better background color. Uh, there is a background on that, but yes. Uh, so you can see that this PDF thing, if you bolt the word, if you bolt the title, it actually draws more attention than simply just increasing the font size. These two are actually the same font size and these two are not the same font size. You can also use it to emphasize information, like you are emphasizing the first name on a card, on a contact card in this case. So another thing is, Please don't cram too much information. Uh, this is a very like excessive example, but you, you still want to make sure that your text remains readable no matter what. So use short descriptions and you know whenever possible, make sure that like keep your information like bite size. If your font size is too small, it will become unreadable for your users. Uh. So font size is also important. No, font choice is important. So what font you choose affects how easy it is to read. I mean, there are a whole bunch of like very fanciful display fonts, like all those cursive fonts, but do they actually make sense in your website? I mean, if you're using a custom font, you, you should just make sure that it is easily readable. And uh, you're strongly, ref I mean, uh, there is no system type uh, font in web, but actually I should remove that. Uh, okay, so, uh, there are a whole bunch of font options for you, um, like uh, for example on Google font and stuff, but like there are a whole bunch of like super fanciful display ones, there are monospace ones. Think about which one is actually appropriate for your website in this case. You're not 
uh, if you're making a game, then you might go with a custom font, but please don't go with like some that's super hard to read and people actually struggle reading. So let's say you're trying to design a chat app, okay? So, you know, maybe this is how your interface looks like. So, I mean, right off the bat, you can, pick, you can kind of see a couple of issues here. Like, uh, the fonts are a mess and everything is a pain. But, uh, so there are a few issues here. So, you know, you can't really have emphasis on whatever is going on because everything is different. But what if you just change it like this? So if you look carefully, uh, the 50 messages over there is now bold to emphasize the information. The, you know, um, the sender's name is now a bit smaller so that it focuses the attention on the actual message content. And using one consistent font, I think this is IBM's like sense, uh, you just have all of your information kind of in, all of the information actually looks consistent. Okay, so now I think we still have time. Oh my God, I'm talking very fast. Okay, uh, yep, so now uh, we have some time to do a design challenge, okay? So here's the challenge. Try to replicate an interface in Figma. So why would you want to clone it? So cloning someone else's design will actually allow you to familiarize yourself with the tools within Figma. So if you clone someone else's design, it allows you to understand their design rationale better. You know, when you do it, you go and think to yourself, why did they choose to put the text over here instead of maybe somewhere else? Why did they choose a, a horizontally scrolling view instead of vertically? I think I have alarms every like few minutes. Okay. Uh, and things like that. And then you can try to upload a screenshot onto the Figma workshop channel, which I believe Rayang has set up. And we'll review these after lunch. So this is an interface. So it, uh, this is Inbox by Google. Uh, it, wa it was great while it lasted. Um, yeah, so you can try to use Figma uh, and try to clone this right now. Yep. Yes, so in a sense, you can take this and you can recreate it in Figma. So let's say, ah, okay, Let, let's just, Okay, so maybe you want to create a new frame over here. So let's take presentation. And maybe uh, let's say you want to clone it so you have this text over here. So you want inbox over here. So basically you replicate this interface, but now you do it yourself and you do it on Figma. Don't, don't just like slap this image in there and call it a day out. So you can feel free to try this out. Uh, yep. Huh? What? Yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just ask them. Yep. Uh, so the image is currently on Discord, so if you, oh great, now I have to wait for Discord to start. Uh, if, so if you are not on the Discord, you can ask, uh, wait, um, okay, if you're not on the Discord, uh, you can approach any of the organizers here and they'll help you get on the Discord. And uh, you can check out this image over here and then you can refer to it uh, by yourself. So can take a look over here. And these are the instructions, okay? 
So let me know if you have any questions. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, we hope you had a good break and ate well. So let's resume BBCS with the talk, okay? So here we have Mr. Paul Taesyong who will brief us about the bridging the next billion users with game five. So let's give it up for Mr. Taesyong. I can get that a lot. So in the end, because like our team is international, so in the end everyone just ended up calling me SK. Yeah, simple as that. So yeah, so the today it's bridging the next billion users with game five. So uh, in terms of table of contents, I'll just do a quick run through about myself, why I got into the web free space, uh, my work at Atlas, the hottest game five startup in Singapore, and also some tips lah on how you can get started. Uh, in the Web3 space. So, yeah, about me. Uh, my designation is a Lambo owner, with a future Lambo owner, la, right? Soon, soon. Yeah. So, I'm a Dunman High School alumnus. I took H2 computing in JC. I'll be entering CS uh, in two months' time. I'm interning at a local Game 5 startup, and I'm a serial rug pull victim. Yeah. So, for those of you who are not sure what a rug pull is, uh, like a scam, uh, basically, in the crypto space. Yeah, but, I don't know, getting rock can be fun sometimes. So, what are my interests? So, my first interest is gaming. So, in school, I spent a lot of time playing games. I uh, spent a whole month playing Witcher 3 in, in school term. And other favorites, Fallout, Death Stranding, Civ 6. Yeah, and I play like Dota 2 socially, just so I can play with some friends and not be a loser. Yep, and my other interest is coding, so I'm a proud six-year Infocom club member, and I love working on group projects and hackathons. Yeah, so I really like the feeling of uh, working together and building something together. So these are some of my, my projects. So recently, uh, last year I was working on Cairo. So Cairo is a peer-to-peer -peer courier service on the blockchain. So imagine you wanted to get food from GrabFood, but you don't want to go through Grab. Right, you want to get your Korean directly so that you can get cheaper fees. Lah. So that's a concept. And a few years back, we also, me and my friends, we did eye care. So it's using AI to detect eye diseases. Yeah. So I mean, if you're interested in this project, you can, you can hit me up later. So yeah, let's go into crypto, the exciting part. So how did I get into crypto? It was in late 2020. I was in NS, not doing much in camp. And just decided to like uh, do a lot of research and fell into the rabbit hole. I bought into like all sorts of projects and hence the subsequent rug pulls. And I was very very pleasantly surprised that uh, a lot that what I knew in, in the gaming space and in the coding space actually was very applicable uh, to building applications on the blockchain. So all of these came together, I got stuck in NS and I was very lucky to be able to land an internship at a local Game 5 startup. So, okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into what Game 5 is. So, Game 5 is basically gaming plus DeFi. Okay, so there's two broad concepts gaming and DeFi. Let's go into DeFi first. So, DeFi is an open global financial system. So, every transaction, right, you can see and you can control. And uh, there is no concept of which country you are in. So you can be sending a transaction from Singapore or be sending a transaction from Africa uh, to when, when an external party looks at it, it's the same. It's the transaction. So you have um, the exposure to global markets. And it opens up financial services to anyone with an internet connection. So in Singapore, we take banks for, for granted because the infrastructure is very well built. But in a third world country, uh, their banks might not be super reliable and uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense to, to put your money with a, with a bank. Yeah. So if we do a simple comparison uh, between DeFi and CeFi, so CeFi being uh, centralized finance, so it's four points, right? So DeFi, you get to control your own money. So you take 100% uh, ownership. So if one day somehow uh, you lose control over your account, there is no one uh, to help you, right? Unlike a bank, like a bank, you have a 
via transaction, you call up the bank and hey, what's up, uh, help me out. Yeah, but there's nothing like that. Yeah, so DeFi is open to a anyone and markets are open 24 seven. So that's why you have a lot of DGENs out there who, who don't sleep and just, <laughs> just play, with, play with their digital tokens all day. Yeah, and the transaction of funds happen in minutes rather than uh, days in the DeFi world. Yeah, so that's a very brief introduction to DeFi, and uh, DeFi. So if you're interested, do uh, read deeper into that. Yeah, but now we go to the games, like the fun part, right? So I'm sure some of you must have heard of Axie Infinity, right? One of the biggest games uh, in the Web3 world. So if you if you draw comparisons, right? Maybe like I would I would say this like. Pokemon kind of thing. You have a 3 v 3 thing going on, you select skill cards, and then you try to beat the other team. Yeah. So the, the thing about this is that, uh, like some, uh, quite a bit of people in the Philippines, they quit their full-time jobs to, to play this game uh, full-time, to earn money. So Axie Infinity is one of the first games, first game that really brought the play-to-earn concept into the real world. So, I mean, it, uh, it was a point where playing this game earns them more money than doing a real-time job. Yeah, but not anymore, la, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and we have Saturn Arena. So, I'm, I'm sure some of you guys have played Brawl Stars before. So you can see, like, the interface is very similar to, to Brawl Stars. But except uh, if you win this game, you, you get to earn some real cash. La. Yeah, so if you're, if you're interested, you know, you can look into Saturn Arena. Yeah, so now the company that I work at, Atlas, Atlas is a local Singapore game by startup. I would say, I think it's the first, first, first one and yeah, probably the only one so far. Yeah, so uh, we want to be the bridge that, uh, bridge the next billion users into the blockchain metaverse and enable anyone to have fun and earn. So uh, we are our main mission is bringing people from the web to space into the web three space. So we have identified two things. So one thing is the financial barrier. So the previous two games I showed you, right, Saturn and Axie, you need to have like a few hundred bucks or even a thousand, a thousand bucks just to get started, just to start playing. And that's not a lot of people have that kind of money, la, right? So we want to lower that financial barrier. So it's free to play and play to earn. And we also want to bridge that knowledge gap because uh, you need to have quite a bit of prior knowledge to even start playing in the first place. But it shouldn't be that way. La. Games should be fun, right? You shouldn't have to like go through like 10 YouTube videos just to figure out what's happening and then start playing. <coughs> yeah, so like this is like the, the catalog of the games that we currently have. So they are all very simple, uh, casual games. So we've got things like Atlas 101. So it's like a stack towers. Uh, what else do we have? Like Gem Attack. Gem Attack is like Candy Crush. Yeah. Flappy Flappy is like Flappy Bird. So we, we bring a lot of these casual games into our ecosystem and we build a play to earn a model around it. Yeah. So I will, I'll, I'll skip this part. I will just show you guys. Uh, you, can, you, can have, you can play some games. I can show off my, my skills. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's play. Uh, let's see, Moonlander. Mo Moonlander is my favorite, actually. Okay, by the way, it's at it's on Atlas.com. If anyone wants to play, free to. Okay, so like it's it's quite simple. You you do like left, right, right to try to land your try to land your rocket. Yeah, it looks simple right on the screen, but like I played a long time to get this game to play. Oh, oh. this mad skills. Oh shit, oh shit. So you, you, you cannot land too fast, right? Because if like if like the red color thing pops up, then you land with that, right? You like you just die instantly. Yeah, big deal. Okay, uh, maybe I, I shouldn't play this game for too long. I should try to kill myself. Hold on. Okay, okay, fine, that's it. I, I die. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's one of the games that uh, we have, and we kind of combine this uh, with these other different concepts 
so we have the concept of uh, so these are just the games right and we have NFTs so of course like how can you not have NFTs so let me let me show you my my cute little dragons so we have we have these cute little dragons they are they are called homos so they like they take after the we model them off like the concept of homodo dragons so it's very uh, Southeast Asian centric, I would say. Yeah. So these these homos, right? Uh, you can like equip them, and then they give you special bonuses. Yeah. So there's a there's a whole bunch of other stuff in uh, in the map. So this is the home screen, and like there's there's a few other screens. But if you guys wanna check it out, I'll, I'll leave it up to you guys to uh, to play around with the game, like right? Yeah. So let me skip this part. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what I've learned in I think I've been there for about six months now. So yeah, I've learned that Lambos are super nice and definitely want to have one in the future. Okay. So in terms of, so Atlas is a startup, right? When I first joined Atlas, it's like there's there's nobody. We are we are we are nothing. And uh, like two months back, we raised uh ten million dollars in funding and there's a lot more in the future. So these are the core values that we, we abide by at Atlas. So the one is uh, action. So as a startup, right, your velocity is very important as a startup. So we, we always build things super fast. Uh, we fail fast and we learn faster. Yeah. Number two is uh, we want to let builders spend time building, do things that matter. So we don't really have a lot of meetings per se. Our focus is very much on, okay, what's the next big feature you're gonna push out? And let's just go, let's just build it and go. Yeah, and change. So we, all of us, we take ownership of uh, our work. If we think that something can be done better, we will like, we'll just do it right now. Yeah, and talk to, we, we love our own games. Uh, we share with people so that they can give us feedback on the games. And we don't build things in, in a bubble. Yeah, so that's that's my team here. Yeah, and my my message here is probably uh, be daring enough to try. So honestly, I'm not like super, I'm not super advanced in terms of like uh, software engineering. I'm like just like uh, I'm like 20, 21 this year only. So I'm also not super good. But I would say uh, when you do have the opportunity and time, uh, go out there and see if uh, you know you can you can get a role or something. Try to try to work on something like yeah, and be daring to try. So at first, right, when they put a, like like an intern listing up, right, they didn't even list for like a software engineer role. I just applied it anyways. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they needed one, so be good for me, I guess. Yeah. So now we move on to getting started and how to get your own Lambo in the Web three world. So I think. Uh, for a lot of us, a good entry point is, is web dev. So you definitely want to like just get the basics right, like your HTML, CSS, uh, and JavaScript. That's definitely one, uh, that's a very good entry point uh, to the software engineering world. And we move on to the more, uh, so a lot of companies these days, they will probably be looking for uh, React and Next.js next developers. So once you, you like, you've got your HTML, CSS, JavaScript down, you want to like build on top of that and learn the framework like React or uh, next next JS. So in terms of blockchain development, uh, things are super new. Things change very quickly, but the fundamentals don't really change. So you've got uh, you've got so on the left here is the most most popular chain uh, with con smart contract support, Ethereum and Web3 JS and Ganache. So these are things that uh, you would need to. You don't have to like be experts at them. You just have to kind of know them to be able to uh, create your own decentralized applications. So I would definitely encourage you guys to just go do a simple online course and uh, get started in the space. Yeah, and my message is uh, stay hungry, keep learning. Yeah, and all the best for your hackathon later. Thanks.
No, no, I was, I was, I'm twisting the thing, it was, it was this side. Oh, oh, you're cool, you're twisting it, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. You know what? Okay, yeah, you don't need it. Alright, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tegan, for your time. Uh, now we're moving right back to our workshop that we had before lunch, which is uh, the ping-pong shot with Jia Shen. Okay, mic test. Mic test. Can you all hear me? Is the mic even? Test. Yeah, should be. Uh, close enough. Okay, so uh, continuing on. Uh, oh, what? Yeah, uh, because it's harder to type. Uh, okay. So, um, continuing on, uh, you can submit, uh, on, okay, so, right now, uh, you don't have to be completely finished with what you have. You can just submit it, uh, onto Discord first. I mean, uh, as I walked around just now, I could see a couple of fairly interesting ones. What the? Okay. I can see a couple of fairly interesting submissions, so you can you can take a screenshot of what you have now and then just submit it in there first. We'll give you the next three minutes. So one p.m. Submit your work by one p.m., guys. Yep. Just just feel free to send a screenshot. Yeah. Yep. You can just submit it as it is. Uh, we don't expect you to be a, to have like a fully completed like super fanciful one because no one's gonna finish that. Yep, okay, I see a couple of submissions here. Does it look like they go with everybody that much? Like, does it look like they go with everybody that much? Like, does it look like they go with everybody that much? Like, for me? Who does? Oh my god. I mean, you're not wrong, but like. Maybe after they axe the product, then Microsoft's like, okay, now, now it's our turn. <laughs> Why does this lapel not work well? Hmm? Why does this lapel not work well? Uh, uh, your shirt is too loose. Yeah, and, and you want to keep it at the middle. Oh. Yeah. So like, it's like kind of like over here. Like yeah. Over, like, over here. There's no angle you can clip it in. Huh? You can't really clip it on an angle. No, like keep it all centered, lah. Oh, oh, like this. Like, uh, yeah, something like that. Okay. Try. Uh, never mind. Just wait, lah. Just one minute. Ah, just ask them one more minute. Submit. Okay, one more minute to submit. Not much better. There's no prizes for the COVID. Hmm? No, the COVID. There's no prizes. Okay. okay, yep, 30 seconds. So if you've done something, just feel free to take a screenshot and just send it onto uh send it onto Discord in the Figma workshop channel.
okay, uh, if you are still submitting, feel free to just keep submitting. We'll just click through some of these and we'll take a look, okay? So thanks to everyone who has submitted already. Um, so let's see. Oh. Okay. So uh, this is, honestly, this, this reminds me of, you know, in Microsoft Teams, uh, when you open up a Word document. Yeah, it kind of looks like that. I mean, pretty good attempt. Uh, I can see that you tried out the search bar. Uh, I'm not sure if this was like a rotated rectangle in circles or maybe you found an SVG of a search icon, but pretty interesting. Uh, there's also this nice thing. So I assume you found an SVG. Wait, no, this, this looks more like circles. Okay, yeah, but you can import SVG. So uh, what you can also do is something like uh, material.io, uh, what material.io, wait, no, fonts.google.com slash icons. So this is an icon set uh, by Google, and there's a whole bunch of icons here that you can use uh, within your within your website and your prototypes. So if you come here, you can actually uh, download an SVG and just chuck it into Figma. Okay, then let's check out this. Oh, so this is actually pretty good as well. So uh, you can see things like contrast being used here to like differentiate different, uh, to like separate different sections of the website over here. And, oh, oh, now this has a bunch of green dots that I have no clue what they're for, but sure. Oh, image placeholders probably. But yeah, good job. So, I mean, you replicated the shadow, which is uh, one of the features that you can find in Figma. N nice, nice EXD. Okay, uh, yep, so good job to this as well. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Um, you know what, this is close enough to uh, Google inbox, right? Th this is email, right? But I mean, this, this is quite nice as well. Um, I do like the card view and the corner, the rounded corners, but another, uh, one, one thing would be, um, you might want to try to align these such that they're all on the same line. So it's the same distance from the edge to the, to the element. So make sure the margin here is the same so that it looks a bit more consistent. Okay, uh, let's take a look. So, oh wow, this has a lot of, this, um, your, your text spacing, your character spacing is quite large, but no worries. So this is pretty interesting too. So you use lines over here to create the, to create the menu thing there. Okay, so let's check out some of these. So, oh wow, this really looks like word, but, so this one's also fairly interesting. So you can see, um, this one uses a whole bunch of rectangles instead. You might want to try to play around with other tools in Figma. Ah. Okay, and um, oh, this has a fancy Mac view. Oh, yes, now, now I'm very biased to this. Oh, you also have a profile image. Sure, okay, so um, <laughs> yeah, so pretty good job overall. Uh, I will scroll through a couple more of these. So, yep, oh, new puppy, okay. Uh, yeah, so you can kind of see a bunch of the design principles earlier, like shown here, like for example, um, just having a single, having a single consistent font throughout the entire thing, just so that it keeps a singular theme and just sticking with a single accent color, in this case, blue. Uh, honestly, my favorite one has to be this, but yes. You know what, is, is there a starboard here? Uh, no, no starboard. I don't care, I'm still gonna start it. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think this is this is a very good job, uh, honestly. <laughs> okay. Um, yep, so a couple more. So, I mean, this is pretty great too. I mean, you guys didn't really have much time, so honestly, I'm surprised that any of you actually managed to submit anything. But yeah, so this is... Wait, isn't that the same profile image? Oh, sure, whatever. I think they cropped it from the original photo. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, then... Um, there is, yeah, so you have the icons here. I assume you cropped this from the original photo, but yeah, no worries. Okay, so now let's move on. Okay, so now let's move to the fun part. Okay, the hackathon. So, do I need to stop and present again? Uh, Actually, I might have to. Yeah, because uh, the slide got updated. I think, I think it's Okay, so the hackathon now. So now we'll release the theme of the hackathon. So 
when you guys get the team, you guys can start thinking about the actual idea you want to build. And here it is. So how might we utilize technology such as AI to better improve the lives of students and teachers? So you guys can start thinking about this now, okay? But to help you guys think, here is uh, the journal. Okay, send the thing in there. So uh, the team will be sent in announcement. Oh, oh the, the team. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see. You know what? I'll, I'll leave it on the hackathon team slide so that everyone can think about it. All right, the, the team has been sent into announcements. You can now take a look. Yep. So here is the well, here's the sent. oh okay here, here's the it's journal. Been, yes, been sent. Yes. Here's the journal. You guys can make a copy of it at tk.sg/bbcs-journal, and uh, you can just make a copy of it and get started. Actually, get started just. Maybe like discuss with your teammates and wait. Let me just send it. No, no, I, I, I don't want. No screenshot. Yep. Don't open. Yep. So um, honestly, that is pretty much the entire plan for the after lunch portion of this workshop. So if you have any questions, any further questions, you can feel free to contact me at any of these avenues. But uh, I'll leave this slide on so that everyone can panic over the hackathon team for a bit. Okay. Yeah, sure. You can link the slides. Oh, wait. Uh, here. Okay. Oh yes. Uh, here's a couple of do's and don'ts. Uh, so you can you can grab the prototype demo from earlier over here. Um, you can you can view the deck and you can also just get started now. There's one bullet point extra. It's annoying me. Okay, yeah, so I also just sent the links into the announcement channel. So you can take a look at the slides that Xia Chen has gone through just now. Uh, specifically, if you want to look at the design part of it, So actually from now until 1.40, it's actually it's time for you to, to, to kind of like discuss within your groups and start your initial prototyping um, stage. Yeah. So it, this is also time if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or, or come and ask um, you know, people in yellow shirts or, 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 or blue shirts or, or whatever organizers are like, uh, you know, Anyone like with kind of clarify what you, questions that you have. So if you for, go for online, uh, you can send your message. Once you open up, uh, open the breakout room once you the side.
later, later. Okay, okay, wait. I thought the idea was to announce two A here, two B here, and it's saying it's the beginning of the E. Okay. And the MC is supposed to do it. Are the MC supposed to do it? Are you aware? Uh, yeah, I'm aware, but they don't know when to say it. So I just say, yeah, just say two A, represent two A. Say, say, what? So say two A to B. Hello, hi guys. Alright guys, okay, so of course the world has come to an end. So now we'll be taking a short break for about like you have like under one point five for short break, then we have our two workshops, two A and two B. So basically you'll be split based on what you selected. So the first workshop is intro to basic web there by Ray Young. The second workshop is AI with that web development, and that's called standard track, which is by me and your name. So uh, after the break, I believe one of some of the facilitators will bring you to the bank, the various venues for, for the, the two workshops. All right, so uh, we'll be doing the workshop split right now. If you have signed up for the intro to basic web dev workshop, please make your way to the back of the LT, uh, but back left hand corner where the where the facilitators are standing with the yellow shirts, where they're waving right now. If you have signed up for the intro to basic web dev workshop, please make your way there now. Otherwise, please stay here for the AI web web dev workshop. All right, we're doing a workshop split. Once again, intro to basic web dev over in SR2. You can migrate over to SR2 right now. Otherwise, see you at uh, our YouTube menu page here if you sign up for the AI workshop. If you are unsure of what you have signed up for, please come down and we'll inform you. Once again, uh, those who sign up for basic to drive their workshop, head over to the seminar room uh, to follow the facility from the back.
if you are joining the basics of web dev workshop, please join the breakout room. Otherwise, please remain in this room for the AI uh, with web dev workshop. Uh, once again, I repeat, those people online, AI workshop is in this room, and basics web dev workshop is in the breakout room. So please join the breakout room if you are joining the basics web dev workshop. Uh, reiterating that uh, if you have no knowledge in web dev workshop, if you have no knowledge in web dev, we would encourage you to join the basic web dev workshop because this workshop here in this room is going to be quite, uh, or quite a high difficulty. So we expect you to have some prerequisites in web dev. Thank you. Anyone last call basics with web dev? The intro to basic web dev. Anyone last call? Last call, last call, last call. So now the workshop is behind that web developed by Bernay and, well, me. So I'll head over the title. Live for sale. You're the tech for sale, but I'm the live stream for sale. Uh -huh. So we've got very sure. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. Exactly. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, sure. so can I perform everyone here is for AI web development? Yes, right? No, no, you can cry. Okay, anyone here is running a Chromebook and cannot use Google for that? Okay, some of you have Google have a Chromebook, but your student account does not allow you to access Google Collab, and you cannot sign into a personal email account on a Chromebook that is issued by school. Everyone has this problem. Because we'll be using Google Collab within the workshop. So if you cannot access Which it, you we'll have to figure something out. By the way. So that's why everyone here what? can access Google Collab, right? Okay, very nice. Uh, if you have any questions during the workshop, you can raise up your hands, and some tech facilitators over there will try and uh, go and address your questions. Otherwise, uh, in between we have some short breaks, especially the transition between the bit of AI part and the web development part, and then we will answer some of the questions that we are able to answer. Alright, so, uh, when you start off with the AI talk. Hold on, just load the slide. Just hold on, just load the slide. Good question, how the fuck do I do that? I don't feel more. Hey, wait, these are all these people I'm staying for. Do you all tell the Zoom people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you confirm that? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Where's 18? Okay, you are a MacBook user. Tell me how to change me. How to change what? Then you multiply that by theta 1. 
If you have X2, you must develop by sigma 2. And if you have X3, you must develop by sigma 3. And uh, then it just sums them up. So the sigma would be the summation symbol. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this. Then after this, you run this thing called the activation function. The activation function allows you to approximate the value between like 0 and 1. So that, that where you use something like called the sigmoid function. There's also other activation functions like the ReLU function. And uh, there's another called ReLU. So we won't be covering like, a lot about it, but basically these activation functions help you in understanding, uh, in like, approximating a value based on the original sum, which gives you an output, yeah. So how does the, this is the one layer perceptron, right? But how do you use a multi-layer perceptron? A multi-layer perceptron works like that, but it's like multiple layers of these perceptrons and multiple perceptrons in each of these layers. So it would be like, let's say you have these inputs, three inputs, which are represented by these nodes, and these are numerical inputs, right? Then uh, you run this uh, neural network onto this, uh, and then it creates like four different uh, nodes. This would be your second layer, which is one of your hidden layers. And what you're going to do is uh, each line represents a different weight. So each parameter is multiplied by that weight and then uh, given to that other perceptron. So those inputs on the perceptron are the ones that really matter to the scale. Then similarly, uh, five layers, and you can go back to two layers. And this is the two layers which we count as the output. So let's say you have to represent, like, uh, it's a binary classification task. And uh, you are doing one hot encoding, which is like, you do, you give it zero. If, like, it's like, uh, basically, if you have a class for um, pa Parkinson's and not Parkinson's, then Parkinson's would uh, have the variable zero, and not Parkinson's would have the variable one in each column. So that's like how it works. But actually, it's not necessary. You can just use one node for those kind of tasks. So this gives you your output, and you can use uh, you can use some kind of like approximation to understand what what the output actually are. So yeah. Based on this, we get to recurrent neural networks and LSTM, which are basically the most basic tasks for NLP. So they haven't been used much in the past few years with the introduction of the transformer, but due to the fact that transformers take hours to train, we won't be using that in this workshop. So. Basically, recurrent neural networks work on this concept of how do we analyze time? How do we analyze time series data? If you have a ball that's moving like this, so let's say this was your original position of the ball, and then you're saying that it actually had a velocity and it moved up, and then it had a, uh, it continued having a velocity of course and it moved up, but it had a smaller like y displacement, and you know that what the downward acceleration is, then how do you know what the velocity vector of the ball at time t equals one is, right? So this is technically the physics question. But you can use neural networks to solve this, and it becomes very useful when you're dealing with text because text is sequential data, which means that you know, you're know you keeping word after word after word. Unlike images, which are, it's like a basic object. You can't really run sequential data on an image. So yeah, that's why it just exists. So um, yeah, so recurrent neural networks basically remember previous input. So if, let's say you have a neural network, and uh, it's like it's like, you know, uh, you are inputting one data uh, data frame, like one sequential part of the data. So basically, it takes one sequential part of the data, it puts it in, then it uh, pops it out. Then it takes the other one, and based on weights it's already learned from the previous input, it trains itself to uh, get used to the new input as well, understand what the new input means. Uh, so it's like, yes, yeah, it's, it's like just able to sequentially figure out a response. So there are two different types of uh, RNNs, usually gated recurrent units, or Long short, uh, long short term memory. So we'll be, we'll be using LSTMs just because LSTMs are much more easier to implement. Uh, and on the other hand, you also have two options, unidirectional and bidirectional. So unidirectional would be like, you, you go one by one through the data. Bidirectional is you learn the data, like the input before and the input after. And from there, you make a decision. So this is used, uh, unidirectional is used a lot in GPT-2 because GPT-2 is text de de generation. And text generation is mainly you have an input, and you continue on the input. So you have to sequentially build up data. But bidirectional would be useful for this since, it's a, uh, since our task is much more pertinent to that, that component. Right now. So yeah, this is how uh, RNN works. Uh, basically, you have an input sentence, and you use this thing called a tokenizer to get specific values for each of these inputs. Then you run something called an embedding to create an array of each, each input. So 
but the input is is it just like um, like the input uh, tokenizer just separates them into like a set of words. So let's say 2,000 words, 20,000 words. This is what we're going to be using in our our code. Then it runs embedding. So for each word, uh, which already has an embedded value, it creates some kind of matrix so that it can communicate. Uh, so it can like find uh, find links between each and every array. So yeah. So when you run the embedding, it basically works similar to that. And you're you're just going to create like an array. So I think this is a 64 64 uh, comp uh, component array. And then after this, you run the bidirectional LLVM, right? The bidirectional LLVM takes each uh, input one by one. So it takes the first array, go, uh, runs through it, takes the second array, runs through it, and so on and so forth until it's able to, to produce like specific specific outputs for each and every single one of the of the artworks, yeah, basically. Then, yeah, what you do is you can run another dense layer, uh, which is another uh, layer hidden, hidden, and you get the artwork. So, uh, for example, let's say you have to predict four classes. Then you can do one hard encoding, which as I mentioned before, is basically saying, is it or is it not, for each of the classes. So let's say, I want to classify whether someone is, uh, well, uh, what class classification? I guess let's say you have a tweet, and you want to classify whether it's a uh, hate speech, it's bullying, it's completely okay, and it's friendly. I guess. So you basically let's say I, I write a normal tweet, right, which is like uh, completely okay, but it's not something that's very friendly because Twitter. So what you can do is uh, you basically say it's zero zero one zero. So zero being that oh it's it's not uh, hate speech. Uh, two, uh, zero on the second one is like it's not uh, what is what is it called? Uh, the third is one because we said that it's a normal sentence, and the fourth is zero because as we know, it's not no, it's like just generic, right? It's not something it's not something that's very friendly. So yeah, now let's get into coding the BDLSVM. So we'll be using TensorFlow for this, and uh, basically what we're doing is we're analyzing this thing called the Maya Briggs test in the data. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. You can also go to this site, I think it's 16 personalities.com, which highlights everything about this uh, type of test. So basically you use the personality test, and there are four, four categories. You are either introverted or extroverted, sensing or intuition, thinking or feeling, judging or perceiving. So like for example, if you are someone who is very into computer science, it's very likely that you're going to be INTP. But it's possible you're you are ENTP or anything else, because uh, everyone has like specific uh, qualities, but if you consider like the most generic programmer, they usually are NTP. So what is our task? Usually the MBTI runs based on like a questionnaire, right? What we're going to use is we're going to use a paragraph, and we'll use that to predict the MBTI score for each individual. So basically we'll have 2,000 inputs, which is like the, the paragraph itself, and you have four outputs. So you, the first output is your probability of extroversion over introversion. Second output is sensing over intuition. Third output is feeling over thinking. And fourth is judging over perceiving. So yeah, I guess we can get to coding. Uh, go to this site and uh, run this, uh, just open the notebook up. You'll see notebook settings and you can uh, you can uh, run it on a GPU or yeah. If you're not able to run it on a GPU, just let us know. We'll share the model with you later.
go home to it once you go home to it there should be just for that cow uh, you shouldn't be able to edit it so what you can do is go to cow and then you can do save a copy in drive and then you save to your google drive account and from there you can edit on your own um, on your own cow so um, so what you need to do is you need to change it to use gpu so it can run faster okay. so you need to go to edit and then go to settings then the hardware accelerator change it to gpu so it might be none and you just make sure it's gpu you click the save so it'll give around uh, give it around say two three minutes and then if you have any issues in time you save it to your hand it will come to run it up you also don't worry, the code won't work unless you know you uh spend in some time. So yeah, uh and please like make make it deliberately difficult for you guys to just run through this workshop and not there and then
possible. Uh, if you guys need me to zoom in, I'll just point it, let me know. So yeah, what we did was we used this function called chain-test split in SK1. So chain-test split allows you to segment your data into testing and training data. So the problem with our current PS3 is that it's very much in that category. So yeah, that's what we've done. And for this, uh, the blank should be raw.gitubusercontent.com. So, uh, yeah, these two blanks, just make sure you fill them up. Now, uh, what you can do to run them is you can press this, this uh, circle, like basically, and you uh, let it run into this. So, because yeah, it's a uh, notebook that's not technically made by Google, so it will ask if you should be running it or not. Now, if you press this, you'll actually, you can actually see this uh, system. Uh, we're not using it, but it's using it later just to download the model. So, from here, it's just a specific system, I guess. Yeah. So, this is your setup and inputs, and now to load your data, as we just, uh, we just did this, we just fixed the, the blank, and we can just put the enter. So, don't run, the, don't remove this unless you want to see a bit. Uh, a few unfavorable words, the sentences, yeah. So, this is like a real world data set, so people are known to put in a lot of un unusual sentences in here. So, uh, as you can see, the sentences don't make any sense at this point, right? That's because we've removed these things called stop words, which are words that, you know, don't have any meaning. They don't really contribute to the, the actual, like, uh, discussion in the uh, model. So, people really don't use it very much. So yeah, uh, we're just going to be using the word without the stop word. And now for training, we need to prepare the variables and split them into the chain, crop validation, and testing data set. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be splitting it into anyways into like this testing, training, and uh, like those two sets. But we also need to create a validation set. So the reason for this is that when we're running AI yeah. models, we need to train it, and then it, it, it runs this thing called epoch. So after each epoch, it runs the model against some validation data to let you know if it's overfitting or not. So overfitting is like a normal thing that happens in AI nowadays. This is like you train the model for so long that it just gets so used to the training data but it starts fitting to the old training data itself. It doesn't even care about the, the validation data. So that's why uh, with body stopping, we just try to avoid that here. Yeah. So if you want to know what the blanks are here, it should be. and y test, yeah. And then uh, this should be uh, tps.keras.preprocessing.text.tokenizer. And then this is the tokenizer code itself, so uh, we'll be using uh, um, inbuilt functions in TensorFlow to do the tokenizing. So this should be to text dot to sequence. Uh, sorry, sequence. where you create your x and y variables. So your y variables in this case are the i taxi split, which is basically us using the raw one to denote whether it's i or e, and or f, and so on, and so on. And after this, we do the training test split. So we're creating a test a validation size, a, a general validation and testing size of about 0 0.4, just 40 percent. And then uh, your test size, uh, your test itself, which is like 40 percent of the data, will be split again into 10% of the 
of the data which is now in the, test, in the actual test site, and then 30% of the data which is your validation site. So yeah, um, so if we like, you know, go ahead I think I already did. Yeah. So you do this, and then, then you get to the model. So your model itself is, you know, <laughs> it, it's where you actually have to care about all of these systems. So if you remember correctly over here, you mentioned that it's 2,000 inputs. So um, this variable here would be 2,000. Yeah, basically. So embedding itself is, as we mentioned before, you take an, a numerical input and you convert that into a sequence that, that can be trained on the BDLS. And it's basically trying to find relations between specific words and what that means in the context of this problem. So yeah, uh, you create this embedding, and after this, what we've done is we've done uh, the we created a bidirectional LSTM, so bidirectional LSTM, and in the LSTM we've taken in the input of 64. The reason for this is because, as we uh, as we mentioned, uh, we're creating an embedding size of 64, and so as it takes each input inward, so each 64 array input goes into the uh, the LSTM and it comes out a 64 variable. So yeah. So let's say you have the dropout, right? Then uh, dropout itself is a normal thing that we do in machine learning, which is to introduce noise to your data. So dropout is like, uh, basically it removes noise. Like uh, in the computation, it will just remove the entire point of the noise, which is uh, to ensure that your model is good in case one of the models node is malfunction. Like it works without those specific nodes. So, then after that, you create a dense layer, and as we mentioned before, this will be 64. Then 64 outputs are going out from the VDLSTM. And then you create a dense layer of four. And since we're finding a value between zero and one, we use this function called the sigmoid function. So if you want to you know, uh, visualize what the sigmoid function is, it's like, um, it's kind of like you go from uh, one to zero, and it has, has one to zero, like the y variable goes there. And at x equals zero, uh, x equals zero, the value is zero point five. So it's like a weird exponential function which we use a lot in this, and also in statistics as well. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This should work. Then, um, in your model compilation, what you have to specify is the loss that you're using. So there are multiple different types of losses that you can use in models like this. There's something called binary cross entropy. There's other losses which have different varying names like the card score and all. And uh, so that's why we're using binary cross entropy for this, just because it's the most basic one. So yeah, I'll put it in here. So yeah, that's how you spell the binary cross entropy. And we're also using this thing called the Adam optimizer, which is used to, you know, optimize your zoning rate. So how much you should be going down the slope uh, to identify the maximum minimum point. And there's also the metrics like the accuracy and the area under the curve of the ROD curve, which I won't be covering because there's a uh, the difficult explain here. Yeah. So then after you fill these in, you can run a model. So that creates this model, uh, and as you can see, the output shape shape is already set up. Yeah. So then you can train the model. So we're using this thing called early stopping monitor, which is uh, you know early stopping on on this system, and uh, we're using uh, yeah basically early stopping on its own is used for basically the same entire task. So yeah. Um, so yeah. So uh, just one note, right? This training process itself will take a while. So for now, that we'll be covering the API. But to recover what the AI itself should be, we'll be fixing this this code out. Yeah.
is call, call back, by the way. And now you can leave it to train. So <laughs> this training process itself should take about half an hour. It may be completely faster just based on the early stopping monitor, but uh, don't be too positive about that. So you can let it run, and uh, Seth will cover the API now.
currently what I'm showing is the API that you that will be available to you guys later develop your web app. So currently if you like to test out this API, it's not actually um, the actual server is not ready yet, so this is currently hosted on uh, my server and my computer. So you will later will distribute the URL to the individual team inside your Discord channel. Uh, I think Ping and some of the other facilitators will help out with that. But okay, so first of all, like I mentioned, the API is called Python and we're using the Flask server. So I'll just give you a rundown of code now, actually in detail later. So first we're importing the basic libraries. So if you're using uh, I believe some of you are using Git port for the um, the web developer part of this. Okay, can I confirm that everybody has Git port ready? Big thing. They have Git port ready, right? Okay, give me a moment. Okay, give us a moment. Um, you can set up Git port. I okay. Can I check who doesn't have a Git port account? Like all of you here. Okay. So okay, to create a Git port account, give me a moment. Okay. So when you go and help you guys with creating a Git port account, and the other guys are still sitting on network, go up and help anyone who doesn't have a Git port account as well.
So, uh, I'll continue for now. So, by one moment. Okay, so assuming you have a git pod, you have a git pod, all you do is go to new workspace. Um, okay. So, I assume that nobody has any easy policies. So, If anyone else is having any tech issues, please raise your hand and I'll text it to you to come to you. Thank you. Try and finish up and look through the whole code. If you haven't run, if you haven't run your code for the model. So for now, I want to go to the report and then you can create a new workspace. Um, and then you can create a new repository in that workspace and then after that, you open up a guest code and enjoy.
a slight problem. OBS quit unexpectedly. Okay. Okay. So I know some of you might need to create a repository. So you know what we'll do instead is I'll push my code to the app and it can say clone my repository and go from there. So the code we're pushing is not complete. So I'm not giving the pull API yet. So the pull API, like I said, will be running on our server and you can access it from there. So for now, um, basically this code just allows you to see how a backend works and then we'll from there if you want to implement your own API methods, you can. And also it's easier to understand the power of code and how you can integrate it with JavaScript to create your web app. I think it's easier for us that we just clone, for, for US as well, if we just clone our repository rather than creating a new one from scratch. So for those who are having issues, I think I'm going to be dropping it. But I think we'll drop the don't see the big fish. So we'll be moving on. So this is what your default should look like. So this is a file explorer. And if you want to change the dark theme, you can go to settings, which is here. Color theme. And then you can change it to a dark theme, if you like. Okay, but basically, this is a file explorer. You can click on this one of the code, and below is a terminal. So for now, I'll be moving back to my... For now, I'll be moving back to my IDE so that, um, because this, this is my server and it's hosting the API from there. Okay, so assuming all of you has is working on my repository, you should be able to see the same code as I. Uh, otherwise, you can raise your hand, contact a sales to go out and help you. Okay, so I'll just give a brief explanation of the code. So the first four lines are basically, basically standard code that you import the best library you know. So, plus, as like three, and waitress. So plus is the server itself. And waitress and serve waitress serve from waitress is basically what I'm using to host or to essentially make my server public. You actually don't need waitress and serve. You plus has its own option to make to basically host the server itself. But I don't recommend it. What do you mean? Super small. Oh, my bad. And uh I'm sorry you have you okay wait. Uh, okay, is this better? Are you able to see now? Can everyone see? Yes? No? Yeah. Okay, so, this first four lines is for the library that we need. So, the first and fourth line tech, the fourth line technique is not needed, but in Spotify there's uh, something that we'll use very often. So, um, we just imported it separately. But, you see this main kind of what's needed. So, plus the plus server. As you like, three, like I mentioned, it's a database, and we need the library so we can import it. And waitress is the additional library I'm using to host the Plus server. And as I mentioned, it's not completely necessary. But I'm using it because it's better in terms of um, content and security. So, app equals to Plus or Plus. Is, this line of code is basically um, default needed to get a Plus server. So, I, I won't even feel like these, this basic code because um, I don't think it's that, sorry, that relevant as compared to the actual API. So, I'll start with this, this first line, line 8. At app.rout, and then you it, you have a string which is slash. So, whatever is inside this app.rout, which is where the argument, is the, your, in a way, the URL or the API endpoint. So, what this means is that whatever your server your URL IP address is, this endpoint, which is basically nothing, will return whatever this function, the function defined below does. So, my test server, um, you can access it if you like. It's test2.5.bs. I just send the link to this one if you like to experiment now yourself. So, if you want to 
So this is basically where my data is registered. So the search means that it's an index for set web readers, but in this case it's just nothing after the URL. And so what this code does is it opens up a file called readme.md and then it returns a file. So if I don't find file and open up readme.md, you can see that this is the dot .dev. So it says hello and this is the dirty blocks conference.api then when you go to the, the API or the URL you get um, you return whatever's in the inside the um, the, 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 the MD file the markdown file okay, so this is really very basic and it's not very useful because you're not actually contributing any data it's just you know it fixed so now we'll be going to something more advanced where actually uses our database and I'll explain the uh, SQLite code along the way. So, like I mentioned, the first argument is always an API endpoint, slash students. So if I go to slash students, if I go to slash students, you will actually see that some data is on the field. So it's quite small, I'll just read it. So it's actually a list, and within the list, is actually a dictionary object. Python this will be a dictionary object. Then you can see it's all of them have the same data, class ID, the name, as well as the student ID. So if I go into the code, uh, it basically gets the data from, a, from the database. So this is SQLite. So basically I define the database object, which is SQLite to connect to the database. So this database is a string, and it's basically the people of DB I have here. So you have to connect to the DB, and then you only only then you will access whatever data or tables, in this case, you have inside the database. Then you create a cursor object with db.cursor. And then after that, with the cursor object, you can actually execute actual SQLite statements. So, in database, there's actually four main operations, CRD. So, this is actually the retrieval, retrieval operation where I read data from the database. So, you use the select keyword to get data from the database. And then the three, the three arguments here, the three things that I mentioned, student ID, name, class ID, is actually what is written. So if I go back to what is written, it's actually student ID, class ID, and name. It's not an exact same uh, order, because there's actually some processing done. So instead, so for example, right, say for example if I go, if I modify this, uh, okay, if I open up a new Python terminal, and just to demonstrate, So 
from the student. Student is the name of the table. And so student is the name of the table within the database. And name is the field within tables, the table student. So I do the fetch one method to get the first record. And then you can see I get the name only on the first record. And then I can do name, comma, class ID. And I also get the class ID. So like I mentioned, you can actually do asterisks to get all of the fields. And within the students table, there's actually another field which is the photo of the student. So as you can see, this is actually the the photo of the student, which is actually stored in bytes or binary data. So it goes up very long, but the first, the first three data that's retrieved is the student ID, the name, as well as the class ID. So, like I said, you can also do fetch all, which will actually get all records for all, basically, which is all of the students. But I won't select all of the fields because as you can see, there's quite a bit of data for the photo and that will basically crash Python. So, uh, so if I do select name from student and I fetch all, it will just return a list of all of the, f all of the records. And, the, and each record is an individual tuple. Okay, so then, like I said, the form, the form here is actually referring to the table. So in another method for the API, another endpoint, I actually do slash teachers and I'm selecting data from the teachers table instead. So what I did here is I separated out the different uh, different data into different tables. <coughs> because what I want to do is have all the data in the students table to be the same. Because in a teachers table, there, there isn't actually a class ID. Because in most schools, a teacher doesn't just teach one class. However, for students, they are usually only in one form class. So it wouldn't make sense to have a class ID for the teachers table. And if I put teachers within the same table as students, they basically won't have a class ID field. It will just be empty. And the issue with that is that that means my database is not, it's not, basically the records within my database is not the same. And when I try to get, say for example, get the class ID when it's a teacher, it could result in some errors. So by separating it out, in a way I ensure that all the data within that table is the same. And it could reduce my chance of error. So, so like I mentioned, the whatever is after form is the table you retrieve data from. And in this case, I'm selecting the teacher ID and name from the teacher's table. Okay. So I go back to the students method, the students endpoint. So like I mentioned, this basically selects this basically selects all of the um all of the student ID, name, and class ID from students, and afterwards it fetches all of the data, and after that, I do db.close. db.close is very important, because if you don't close a database, you could potentially corrupt or lock your database and prevent you from using it. So always remember to close your database after you've done all operations you need to. So this is the function. So this function is only called whenever somebody uses the slash students endpoint. And so basically, after this operation, this cursor dot fetch all, that's the last operation I'm performing on the database. So I choose to close it immediately afterwards. And then whenever you do connect, you basically start or open up the database again. So you can always just reopen and reclose the database as needed. And like I said, like I mentioned, you can actually try out like basically access this, this data, uh, this endpoint with the URL I sent in Discord. So the URL is over here, and you can just, just do slash students at the end, or slash teachers, and then you'll be able to see the various data that's written by it. Okay. So after that, I just define a new variable which is an empty list for data2. And so what I do is that because the data here is actually not formatted. Like I said, the data return is actually a list of tuples. Okay? And I want to return it as a dictionary, or more, which is very similar to a JSON object in JavaScript. The reason I'm doing this is so that when you, when you develop your web app in JavaScript, it's easier for you to deal with a dictionary object as a JSON object in JavaScript, as JS loves JSON. So here, I basically basically get all the data in data and make it a dictionary object, and, up and add all of it to data2. And then I do plus or make response, and JSONify it, basically converting the data2, which is data2, is, after I do this actually, data2 is a list of, uh, sorry, a list of dictionaries. 
So I can actually do I can actually do print data and print data to to demonstrate. try the slash load method right now then um, I should be able to see when you try it out it should print out data and data too okay thank you okay so okay I sh okay so from here on from here it's basically the data so as I mentioned whenever you do X which um, sorry whenever you do fetch all it returns a list of tuples and each tuple is individual record but like I said, I want it to be more like a JSON or a dictionary. So, like I said, after it, after I get data, I basically individually iterate through the tuple and then convert it to a dictionary. And then, as you can see, when I print out data two, which is the is essentially a formatted data, is actually a dictionary. Which is, say for example, this is one record that has been converted to a dictionary. So it's a list of dictionaries starting from here. And after that, I make response. And then I put in the data 2 and 200. So what 200 actually is, is the HTTP response code. So 200 stands for OK. So you won't be able to see the response code from here. I mean, you can see it if you do um, you open up the, you might be able to see it from here in the inspector. But instead of what I'll do is I'll go to, sorry, I can't see my own cursor. Okay. What I'll do is instead I'll go to command prompt. Uh, sorry, file shell. If I invoke web request, it basically sends a get request to my endpoint. So, so this basically sends a request. Default, by default, it's get if you don't specify it. And it sends it to this endpoint. As you can see, it gets the status code 200 OK. So if I actually change the status code to say something like 404, right, which is 404 not found, if I rerun the code, If I rerun the code and I try running it again, as you can see, I get an error because it actually it actually still sends out the data, but there's actually an error. And the error is that I mean, even though data is written, the error is because I use 404, and what happens is that my my terminal actually thinks that there's an error and this thing doesn't actually exist. So the obvious difference is because of the response code. It actually, in a way, in a way, it actually still works. By tricks, PowerShell is thinking that um, that basically there's nothing there. So when when you when you decide to do your make response, what you should do is obviously set the correct response code. You can check the correct response code from um, there's I think Wikipedia has 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 some um, has basically the list of response codes, but most common is 200. And by default, in Flask, if you access an endpoint that is not defined, say if I go to if I go to this and I do slash hello, which I don't have an endpoint named hello, you automatically return a 404 not found error. So I, it's not very common that you will need to de manually define a route and a response with 404 not found error because there, there's no point in defining an endpoint and then putting 404 when you can just not define it because you're not supposed to return anything there. Does that make sense? Because 404 is something that doesn't that shouldn't exist on your server. Okay. So you might notice that my methods I put something met equals to get. So in, in HTTP, there's various methods like get, post, and put. So get request is in a way when a client sends a get request, it's trying to retrieve data from the server. So what this does is it only allows get request. So if I try something like a post request instead, uh, I'll actually get an error. So I can demonstrate this in PowerShell.
combine it with that me method is post. Okay, uh, this one is put into one step. See when I try a method that is not allowed put, right? The put method. Put method is basically to, to send data to the server. So one case you use put method is say you want your user to give you data. So one example of this is say we actually have a library database. So say your web app interacts with the library database, say you want to get um get somebody wants to borrow a book. So then you need to update which books are involved. So what you do is send a put or post request stating that and you pass in some uh, fields. Say for example, the book ID, and then you send say another data saying that oh the book wrote. Then you send a put request, and what this means is that the server will actually receive the data, and then you update the database internally with the code, and then from there, um, then basically you update the record and say you refresh your page, and you show the book in both. So you can see here when I try put, it says method not allowed. Okay, it actually returns a HTTP error, and there's there's a there's error code for method not allowed. But say if I allow the put method in my code temporarily for demonstration purposes, if I do this, and I reload the code, and if I send it, and now you can see after I allow put request within my code, it actually doesn't return the error anymore. So, but the reason you shouldn't allow put or allow methods that you shouldn't you shouldn't really expect, right? Oh you shouldn't really expect because there could be unexpected errors because when somebody does put, they could actually be sending data to your server and if your code isn't built in a way that you can react properly when say unexpected happens like when you pass in data in the headers your server application could crash or it might corrupt your database so by doing this in a way it kind plus in a way basically filters out whatever, whatever shouldn't be happening and say your method is only for sending of data and you have nothing to retrieve, by setting it to only put or post, it basically basically prevents you from having to return your own error code. And the proper error code would then be method not allowed because you're supposed to be expecting data, but the user is trying to retrieve data. And so basically the rest of this is the same code, basically retrieval of data from the database, formatting the database into something like a dictionary, and then after that sending out which is basically returning the data and then it's doing this kind of stuff. So, so for example like slash classes, if I do if any you can actually try all this out because the server is running. You can do slash classes and then you can see again it's another list of dictionaries. And then you have class sorry. So basically the first field is class ID, class name, form teacher and grade. As you can see, when I actually format it, it's in the same order. Class ID, class name, grade, and from teacher ID. Right. Okay, so this will be the end of the SP Lights and Plus section. Um, we'll go on to the AI section, and after that, if you have any questions, uh, I can come over and help you. But uh, just to end off, to basically host your server, you have this code at the end. What this means is that if anybody accesses your IP address or your host name, it basically um, basically just runs the app. So all you just need to do is just copy. Thank you. All you need to do is just copy this code, the end part, as well as the um, this first few lines, and then you can start creating your own custom functions and endpoints. All right. I'll hand over time to Bernie now to go go to the AI part. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Um,
Okay, so we'll just think. Uh, if, especially if you have time for different this is go here. So you find the template file that was originally with all the blanks and stuff. This would be the file that we just were trying to make it work. <laughs> and this is the final model. So what you have to go and just go into the model and download this uh, this file. So yeah. Normally, just download this. It's in terminal AI. Yeah. 
assuming you didn't, you're all in press, or, okay, so maybe really, if you find out in press, if you didn't, you didn't find out. Assuming you did time out, what you could do is you could retrain the model at home or if you have a GPU that you could use, you could train it again. But say you don't want to train it, you can actually use our, like I said, we actually have the model that you upload and then you also have the, the API which actually does use our model. So training your own model is, in a way it's not necessary for you to complete the entire web app lab. But it's just, uh, it's good for you to learn when training oh, because it allows you to understand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so everybody's model and said he died. Yeah, died, because it's collapsed. So, like I say, what do you recommend is if you have a. Uh, it's fine, actually, uh, you can just use this. Um, I'm just going to copy the code for you. Yeah, this is connected. Um, so, um, open your class notebook, right? And then go to the place where we define the model. So, and then just. Okay. Copy this piece of code, this model equals the app under this, and then write model of those rates into this. Uh, upload your MVTI, and you should be able to load the model. Now, uh, I'll just cover this stuff as well. So, um, this should be um, down. Um, then, this should be apply map. Yeah, okay. Load your data again, since the data itself doesn't take too long to load. Separate the variables, but uh, it's just so that you can get that thing set. Uh, then uh, go in here, go to this. Um, do this. This will just load. Yeah. Then after this load, um, you should be able to see that it has a pretty bad performance, what, 10%? But that's because uh, its code is in task, actually. So I guess the uh, indicator when it gets over the task, the intuition is every task, the feeling or thinking task, and the perceiving and judging task. So, yeah, then uh, it did actually end random random to do slightly worse. In this case, it did much better than expected. But yeah, as you can see, the model still does better than randomized right, variables. Now, uh, this would be mixed in model. So this is not necessary. You won't run this because we already showed you how to load the model. So if you don't have the model yet, just use this. And you will see the model, exact same model, in this model folder. So don't worry about that. Okay, so just to wrap up, like I said, the accuracy is low because if you learn in math, probability is so some of probability of the various things is just multiples of each other. So the accuracy of it is like fifty percent of each thing, fifty times fifty times fifty times fifty, because it's four different references. Then that, that's why it's bad. So some methods to increase the accuracy would be to train for longer, the bigger data set, and also to improve my processing because for stuff like NLP, natural language processing, there's a lot of pre-processing methods that you could use. For example, in this case we did tokenization. We didn't do we did tokenization, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't do vectorization, which actually converts the words into vectors or numbers, essentially. So there's a lot of NLP pre-processing steps. There's different models, different different type of AI structures and networks that you could use. So this is a very basic model, as you can see, it's only uh, five layers. Yeah, technically. Yeah, yeah so only five layers, and considering that two of them are input and output, you only have three, three hidden layers. So it's not a very complex model. And definitely, we did not train it for long enough, or with a very big data set. So you can work on this in your own time to try and improve the accuracy. And I think it's definitely possible to get something above 50% accuracy overall, which is really good for something like this. Right? Alright, so uh, I think this is the end of our workshop. So again, uh, any questions you can definitely post it in I believe you can post it in the channel. You can I can find any of the facilitators and then they come grab us and can help you guys with any of your code questions. Or if you want to have a demo of the server part, like you know the API, you can definitely do that. So I think now it's break, right? And
Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're trying to get our API to actually use the uh, model so that you can submit some text and get some sort of inference. Okay. Okay, so now we have a 15 minute break. We should take a break after this, but give us two minutes, we can get it working, and then do something with you guys. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, so just really quick. I'm going to probably do a boomerang. Y'all, yeah, okay. I'm going to do a boomerang. Um, this will be posted in the UBCS Instagram. Go follow if you haven't, by the way. Um, so I'll just be doing it really, really quick. Okay, give me a moment. Once y'all are done, uh, let me know. Then can everyone move to the middle? Okay, you don't have to follow the positive for now because we spent quite a bit of time and it would take a bit more to actually debug it. So uh, currently, just like uh, go on with whatever you uh, whatever the task is that you want. Okay. To do. So, like I said, in a, in a way to do a hackathon. So in a way to do a hackathon, you. Well, it's not recommended to start coding immediately. So you start by prototyping. So the API part of the the, the AI part of the API will release it later. But the normal text-based data like the library, the personality, stack tabling, and student data, the API that part of section will be released by the end of today. Uh, by the end of uh, our conference today, which is around 5 p.m. And like I said, we'll each team will have their own in a way their own. Um, API because you may want to modify your code like I mentioned and then we'll have code for you so we'll update you with your uh, specific team endpoints as well as um, any requirements that you might need within your channels the individual team channels all right thank you okay guys just to quickly wrap up if you are done please come to the middle for like a quick boomerang so let's go Okay guys, if you're done, come to the middle section for a while. We'll just take a really, really quick boomerang. Go take. It'll take less than two minutes. Yes, come in now. Let's go. Okay, so uh, we are the TRE team, so we are doing all tech analysis for digital computing in our high school. So for today and tomorrow, we'll be teaching you how to create a first uh, step web app using Vue.js. So I'll now pass the time on to Kai Chi, who will be showing you 
using what the purpose of an app is. Hi everyone, so right now I'll be doing like a brief introduction on how the TIA app came about. And also we'll be showing how it's like with a live demonstration later on. Many students say the fear of studying and catching up with the syllabus. I'm sure many of us here might find revision quite daunting and difficult to handle at times, as there are simply too many subjects and topics to account for. We will hence need to rely on something to keep us in check so that we can revise more efficiently. TRE aims to provide a useful study method to the user so that they can adapt and cope with their revision without being overwhelmed. On many occasions, students may have actually revised, but they still face uncertainty in topics that they are weaker in. This brings about confusion and doubt, as some students tend to revise the entire content again instead of just focusing on the topics that they are weaker in. TRE incorporates a learning and revision method called NG. For those of you here who are not sure what NG is, it's basically like flashcards. So for example, like you have a piece of paper, you'll write down the question on one side and the answer on the other side. So during revision, you'll pull out all these flashcards that you have made, and then you'll uh, look at the question and formulate the answers in your mind. So TRE is basically like a digital version of flashcards. This method of studying eradicates the confusion of what students know or don't know after studying and they are able to mark out the questions and topics that they are unclear of. And these questions will be tested to the students frequently so that um, packets of information will be in their mind. Some students may also be unclear of the content needed for revision, so they end up having to flip through many books and take stacks of notes in order to find the right answer, which is definitely a hassle. TRE seeks to help students take the most out of their precious revision time by providing the most accurate answer with the click of a button, helping users to revise efficiently. Right now, we'll be bringing you through a live demonstration of the TRE app so that you get a better idea of how it's like. So now 
now you uh, invite everybody to uh, try to code along with us. So I want everybody to go to this page. The link is up top. Uh, the back, uh, the backstage can we send the link to the this call? I I sent the link into the Discord chat. Yeah. So I hope you all can use to access it.
now you press this button here, use this template. Okay, you know what I'm going to do is you need to change the order to yourself, not any other organization. So I'll be TRA uh, demo. Something like that. Okay? Every 10, then I'll go and press every time I click the public here. Any, any problems you can text in the Discord chat. Yeah. Okay. Then I'll just press this create repo from template. Okay. So now I create a repo like uh, with my icon. <laughs> okay. So what uh, we will be using for today is we will be using Gitpop. So for those that went through the intro to webs, web app, web app, right, you won't be able to go through anything about Gitpop. So to keep things short, Gitpop is a online, online editor. It's like uh, VS Code but online. Because most of you here use Chromebook, so we're going to use something that's online for you all to work on. Okay? So with that, I want you to go to Gitpod, gitpod.io. Okay, so They prompt you to open the VS Code, press cancel. Yeah, then uh, just stay on this page. This is on the screen there.
Okay, so I hope everybody can see that we have loaded this page on the screen here. So it will show welcome, then followed by a big box. There's some code here and some famous guy. So we're going to break down how this template works. Okay. So what, what we're going to do here first is we're going to go to views. On your explorer, on the left hand side, there's some views. Then we're going to go to add from view. So, uh, the welcome, the welcome text here comes from this uh, code, where it says welcome. So, we don't really need this welcome text here, so I'm going to remove it. I'm going to press, I'm going to highlight the welcome and press backspace. Okay, alright, it's supposed to just run itself. So you can just reload the page and the welcome will be gone. Everybody can catch up. Give me a guess. No, say no. Mr. Easton can catch up. Are you okay, Easton? Okay. Great. Okay. So now we're going to look at the, the main block here. So in the main block view, there's a lot of this uh, commented out things. So we're going to remove this because uh, it doesn't show us anything. Okay? And uh, deleting that won't affect any of my code. Everything has that. I just deleted everything in the green, highlighted in green. The county. Okay, okay. I have this uh, comment out of page, right? I just press next place. I did it. You don't understand? <laughs> no, what part do you don't understand? Which one? The green one. The green one is hard. There is less than more by exclamation mark. It's exaggerated like that. In the main top view. Views, main top view. Yeah, okay. So this will have no effect on your uh, resultant web page.
Give us a moment.
anybody put the color is not highlighted like here? It's not highlighted here. Yeah. Aiden, Aiden. Wi-Fi problem. Huh? Wi-Fi problem. Okay. So in Beauty 
find you find a lot of uh, documentation on how to create a few apps. Okay, so you go to learn and press guide. Okay, so you go press the left hand side. Okay. Then we go to other UI components. This will show us a lot of UI components that you can copy from. So the word I just copy here because it is a very uh, common thing we do here in Vue.js because it acts as a very good uh, jumpstart on how to create the new apps. Okay. So we we'll scroll down to we we'll scroll down to tables. Then under data tables. Okay. So we want something that is very similar to what we have here. So there's, uh, there's buttons for us to interact with and everything. So let's scroll down. Just keep scrolling down to the bottom. Then you'll find something known as the crude actions table. So what is crude? What is crude? It stands for create, retrieve, update, and delete. So creating will mean that creating will mean I enter a new item, enter a new item, and I'm going to get new elements into it. Then retrieving will then be this whole data, which the the one that I just added is also included inside. Then updating will be on editing, so you can edit the data that you have just input. Okay. Then the last one will be D, it stands for D. So you can just press D here and uh, this will be gone. Okay? So in Vue.js, in this group define, you can use uh, this less than or more than uh, function here. So there's template and script. So these are very two important components in Vue. There's a template and there's a script. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy... Okay, hold on. Uh, go back to the report. I just want to delete all this code here. Okay? Main top view, delete all the code. Main top view, delete all the code now. I think some of you didn't catch the 25 bar. So, so, everybody look at, look at. So we go to 25. So this is a framework for Vue.js. It's like a documentation. So all, all the examples will be in 25. So you go to 25, press learn, and go to guide. Then we have UI components. Then we'll scroll down, everything catch, catch, okay? Scroll down to uh, tables, other data tables. So I'm going to scroll all the way down until this two actions table. Two actions table will be under here. Got it, got it? Okay. Okay, 
So this is a very good function that we can use in our app, app development. Got it, got it? Okay. 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 So uh, we can click this view source icon here. So there's a template and a script. In group development, there is a template and a script. So the template will be how all this data will be shown. And the script will be how this data will be processed. Okay? So, I will go back to the port. In the main of will delete everything. Delete all the code. Control A, delete. Command A, delete. Yes? 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 Yes?
So I want to remove this by two page, this by two text here. I want to replace it with the reader head to make it mine. Okay. So I'll go up to the generated page and I'll find my truth. And I found my truth here, okay? So I'm going to replace it with the revision head. So I'm going to add line shroud, the V file title, I'm going to replace it with the revision set. Okay, then I'll go back to the web page. Then I'll refresh it. And then the my crew has changed into the revision app.
then the, the dessert has changed to gags really. Okay, I'll go a bit faster, then uh, you don't need help, you can call the marshals. Okay? So now, so now uh, I'm going to delete some of the data. So all this data is already preloaded in this block desserts. So this is a very, this is like a dictionary for all the desserts. Okay? So, uh, to just keep things short, from this line under the keypad, I'm going to delete everything. Delete everything up until uh, I scream. Everything until frozen yogurt. Okay. Okay.
anybody need help? Is that him? Okay. I so call the the TV, the digital item part to me, right? Okay, everything under the digital item part to me, from the B call, the starting B call, maybe all the way until protein, the, the ending B call. Can you all find it? Yeah. Okay. Can I? Can we move on? Change this dessert name to that name. Okay? So, on the label, editor item dot name, there's a label here. So, I'm going to change this dessert to that. Okay? So, if you load this page, then we tag name. Everybody get it here? Continue. 
Halo, halo. Oke. Okay. So now we come here. Okay. So we notice that the desserts here, right? It's still, it's still taking from the desserts already. So what I'm going to do here, right? I'll go press Ctrl F. Then I have this column here. I'm going to search for all the desserts. Then I press this, uh, this button here. I'll press that. So what I'm actually doing here, I'm not actually affecting the code, but I'm just changing the name of the array. So if somebody else takes over the code, it will be easier for them. Okay? So I'm going to press, keep on pressing enter, and all the desserts will change to that. Okay. Everything you get it? Okay. Then, uh, the quick package will be changed up. They're probably overrunning, right? Can you cut short? How much? Oh. Try to end by 5, 30 something. Originally, you are until 5. You are originally until 5. But how much more content do you have? A bit only. Oh. Okay. 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 So, uh, I hope everybody has done that. So what are we going to do now, right? What are we going to do now, right? For action clicks, right? As you can see here, we use buttons instead. So, for Drill.js, how we use, how we use uh, buttons is we call something called V-BTN. Okay? So I'll go to, I'll go to wherever this pencil and dustbin is. It will write over here. So initially, this uh, example is called the icon, which they are able to call MDI pencil, which is a reference to a pencil. Okay? So I'm going to change this to B button. B dash BDN. Okay? Then I'm going to just refresh the page. Then you'll notice that there's a, there's a button instead, there's a button instead of a, a pencil now. And since you didn't call the V icon page, you now you're not you not be using an icon, okay? So what we're doing here is I'll be changing this to and okay. So uh, you edit as a edit picture, okay? So I want you to do the same for the MDI So take out V icon. Then uh, you know that it's not an icon anymore, so we just to this. Okay? So uh, we're going to create a new V button page. A new button here. Okay? Instead of edit now, I'm going to test. This is for us to test the text. Okay? So at the end of the day, you're supposed to have something like this. The test edit TV. If you want to help this, really please come and uh, use our friends.
This other to be going in linking to another website. But so I don't use this function for now. Okay. So for S and D, I will use the active function. Okay. Then for the D, for the D button, you can name the D item. So that's it. So that's an edit to do nothing when you press it. I hope you all can do something like that. Yeah. And for us, this is our
you can walk. Thanks for watching the video. To watch more, do click on the playlist linked in the description or check out our channel for more videos like these. And if you like, do consider con subscribing to our channel. It really means a lot to us. Thank you and have a pleasant day.